Brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Great Wall of China The Great Wall of China is a series of fortifications made of stone, brick, rammed earth, wood, and other materials. Generally built along an east to west line across the historical northern borders of China to protect the Chinese states and empires against the raids and invasions of the various nomadic groups of the Eurasian steppe. Several walls were being built as early as the 7th century BCE. These later joined together and made bigger and stronger and now collectively referred to as the Great Wall. Especially famous is the wall built 220 to 206 BCE by Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. Little of that wall remains. Since then, the Great Wall has been rebuilt, maintained, and enhanced. The majority of the existing wall is from the Ming Dynasty. Other purposes of the Great Wall have included border controls allowing the imposition of duties on goods transported along the Silk Road, regulation, or encouragement of trade and the control of immigration and emigration. Furthermore, the defensive characteristics of the Great Wall were enhanced by the construction of watchtowers, troop barracks, garrison stations, signaling capabilities through the means of smoke or fire, and the fact that the path of the Great Wall also served as a transportation corridor. The Great Wall stretches from Dandong in the east to Lop Lake in the west, along an arc that roughly delineates the southern edge of Inner Mongolia. A comprehensive archaeological survey, using advanced technologies, has concluded that the Ming Walls measure. This is made up of sections of actual wall of trenches and of natural defensive barriers such as hills and rivers. Another archaeological survey found that the entire wall with all of its branches measure out to be names. The collection of fortifications now known as the Great Wall of China has historically had a number of different names in both Chinese and English. In Chinese histories, the term Long Wall appears in Sima Qian's records of the Grand Historian, where it referred to both the separate Great Walls built between the north of the Warring States and to the more unified construction of the First Emperor. The Chinese character is a phono semantic compound of the place or earth radical land whose old Chinese pronunciation has been reconstructed as den. It originally referred to the rampart which surrounded traditional Chinese cities and was used by extension for these walls around their respective states. Today, however, it is much more often simply the Chinese word for city. The longer Chinese name, 10,000 mile long wall, came from Sima Qian's description of it in the records, though he did not name the walls as such. The 493 CE Book of Song quotes the frontier general Tan Daoji referring to the Long Wall of 10,000 miles, closer to the modern name. But the name rarely features in pre-modern times otherwise. The traditional Chinese mile was an often irregular distance that was intended to show the length of a standard village and varied with terrain, but was usually standardized at distances around a third of an English mile. Since China's metrication in 1930, it has been exactly equivalent to, which would make the wall's name describe a distance of. However, this use of 10,000 is figurative in a similar manner to the Greek and English myriad and simply means innumerable or immeasurable because of the wall's association with the first emperor's supposed tyranny. The Chinese dynasties after Qin usually avoided referring to their own additions to the wall by the name of Long Wall. Instead, various terms were used in medieval records, including frontier, rampart, barrier, the outer fortresses, Waibao, and the border wall, Biangqiang. Poetic and informal names, 
For the wall included the Purple Frontier, Zizai and the Earth Dragon, too long. Only during the King period did Long Wall become the catch-all term to refer to the many border walls regardless of the location or dynastic origin, equivalent to the English Great Wall. The current English name evolved from accounts of from early modern European travelers. By the 19th century, the Great Wall of China had become standard in English, French, and German. Although the European languages continued to refer to it as the Chinese Wall, Early walls The Chinese were already familiar with the techniques of wall building by the time of the spring and autumn period between the 8th and 5th centuries BCE. During this time, and the subsequent Warring States period, the states of Qin, Wei, Zhao, Qi, Jian, and Zhongshan all constructed extensive fortifications to defend their own borders. Built to withstand the attack of small arms such as swords and spears, these walls were made mostly by stamping earth and gravel between board frames. King Zheng of Qin conquered the last of his opponents and unified China as the first emperor of the Qin dynasty in 221 BCE, intending to impose centralized rule and prevent the resurgence of feudal lords. He ordered the destruction of the sections of the walls that divided his empire among the former states to position the empire against the Zhongnu people from the north. However, he ordered the building of new walls to connect the remaining fortifications along the empire's northern frontier, transporting the large quantity of materials required for construction was difficult. So builders always tried to use local resources. Stones from the mountains were used over mountain ranges, while rammed earth was used for construction in the plains. There are no surviving historical records indicating the exact length and course of the Keen walls. Most of the ancient walls have eroded away over the centuries, and very few sections remain today. The human cost of the construction is unknown, but it has been estimated by some authors that hundreds of thousands, if not up to a million, workers died building the Qin Wall. Later, the Han, the Sui, and the Northern Dynasties all repaired, rebuilt, or expanded sections of the Great Wall at great cost to defend themselves against Northern invaders. The Tang and Song dynasties did not undertake any significant effort in the region. The Liao, Jin, and Yuan dynasties, who ruled northern China throughout most of the 10th-13th centuries, constructed defensive walls in the 12th century, but those were located much to the north of the Great Wall as we know it, within China's province of Inner Mongolia, and in Mongolia itself. Ming Era The Great Wall concept was revived again under the Ming in the 14th century, and following the Ming army's defeat by the Oirats in the Battle of Tumu, the Ming had failed to gain a clear upper hand over the Mongolian tribes after successive battles, and the long-drawn conflict was taking a toll on the empire. The Ming adopted a new strategy to keep the nomadic tribes out by constructing walls along the northern border of China, acknowledging the Mongol control established in the Ordos Desert. The wall followed the desert's southern edge instead of incorporating the bend of the Yellow River. Unlike the earlier fortifications, the Ming construction was stronger and more elaborate due to the use of bricks and stone instead of rammed earth. Up to 25,000 watchtowers are estimated to have been constructed on the wall. As Mongol raids continued periodically over the years, the Ming devoted considerable resources to repair and reinforce the walls. Sections near the Ming capital of Beijing were especially strong. Qi Jiguang between 1567 and 1570 also repaired and reinforced the wall, faced sections of the ram earth wall with bricks, 
and constructed 1,200 watchtowers from Shanghai Guan Pass to Changping to warn of approaching Mongol raiders. During the 1440s-1460s, the Ming also built a so-called Liaodong Wall, similar in function to the Great Wall, but more basic in construction. The Liaodong Wall enclosed the agricultural heartland of the Liaodong province, protecting it against potential incursions by Jurch Mongol Oriangan from the northwest and the Jianzhou Jurchens from the north, while stones and tiles were used in some parts of the Liaodong Wall. Most of it was in fact simply an earth dike with moats on both sides. Towards the end of the Ming, the Great Wall helped defend the empire against the Manchu invasions that began around 1600. Even after the loss of all of Liaodong, the Ming army held their heavily fortified Shanghai Pass, preventing the Mancus from conquering the Chinese heartland. The Mancus were finally able to cross the Great Wall in 1644, after Beijing had already fallen to Li Zicheng's rebels. Before this time, the Mancus had crossed the Great Wall multiple times to raid. But this time it was for conquest. The gates at Shanghai Pass were opened on May 25th by the commanding Ming general, Wu Sangui, who formed an alliance with the Mancus, hoping to use the Mancus to expel the rebels from Beijing. The Mancus quickly seized Beijing and eventually defeated both the rebel-founded Shun dynasty and the remaining Ming resistance, establishing the Qing dynasty rule over all of China. Under Qing rule, China's borders extended beyond the walls and Mongolia was annexed into the empire. So constructions on the Great Wall were discontinued. On the other hand, the so-called Willow Palisade, following a line similar to that of the Ming Liaodong Wall, was constructed by the Qing rulers in Manchuria. Its purpose, however, was not defense, but rather migration control. Foreign Accounts of the Wall None of the Europeans who visited Yuan China or Mongolia, such as Marco Polo, Giovanni da Piandel Carpine, William of Rubruck, Giovanni de Marignoli and Odoric of Pordenone, mentioned the Great Wall. The North African traveler Ibn Battuta, who also visited China during the Yuan Dynasty circa 1346, had heard about China's Great Wall possibly before he had arrived in China. He wrote that the wall is 60 days travel from Zaitun in his travelogue gift to those who contemplate the wonders of cities and the marvels of traveling. He associated it with the legend of the wall mentioned in the Quran, which Dual Kamain was said to have erected to protect people near the land of the rising sun from the savages of Gog and Magog. However, Ibn Battuta could find no one who had either seen it or knew of anyone who had seen it, suggesting that although there were remnants of the wall at that time, they weren't significant. Soon after Europeans reached Ming China by ship in the early 16th century, accounts of the Great Wall started to circulate in Europe, even though no European was to see it for another century. Possibly one of the earliest European descriptions of the wall, and of its significance for the defense of the country against the Tatars, may be the one contained in Joao de Barros 1563 Asia. Other early accounts in Western sources include those of Gaspar da Cruz, Bento de Goes, Mateo Ricci, and Bishop Juan González de Mendoza. In 1559, in his work, A Treatise of China and the Adjoining Regions, Gaspar da Cruz offers an early discussion of the Great Wall, perhaps the first recorded instance of a European actually entering China via the Great Wall came in 1605, when the Portuguese Jesuit brother Bento de Goas reached the northwestern Giu Pass from India. Early European accounts were mostly modest and empirical, 
closely mirroring contemporary Chinese understanding of the wall. Although later they slid into hyperbole, including the erroneous but ubiquitous claim that the Ming walls were the same ones that were built by the first emperor in the 3rd century BC, when China opened its borders to foreign merchants and visitors after its defeat in the First and Second Opium Wars. The Great Wall became a main attraction for tourists. The travel logs of the later 19th century further enhanced the reputation and the mythology of the Great Wall, such that in the 20th century, a persistent misconception exists about the Great Wall of China being visible from the Moon, or even Mars. Course Although a formal definition of what constitutes a Great Wall has not been agreed upon, making the full course of the Great Wall difficult to describe in its entirety, the course of the main Great Wall line following Ming constructions can be charted. The Jiu Pass, located in Gansu Province, is the western terminus of the Ming Great Wall. Although Han fortifications such as Yuman Pass and the Yang Pass exist further west, the extant walls leading to those passes are difficult to trace. From Jiu Pass the wall travels discontinuously down the Hexi Corridor and into the deserts of Ningxia, where it enters the western edge of the Yellow River Loop. At Yinchuan, here the first major walls erected during the Ming Dynasty cuts through the Ordos Desert to the eastern edge of the Yellow River Loop. There at Piantu Pass Piantowan in Xinzhou, Shanxi Province, the Great Wall splits in two, with the Outer Great Wall, Yi Changcheng, extending along the Inner Mongolia border, with Shanxi into Hebei Province, and the Inner Great Wall, Nechiang Cheng, running southeast from Piantu Pass for some, passing through important passes like the Pingxing Pass and Yanmen Pass before joining the Outer Great Wall at Sifheriere in Beijing's Yankin County. The sections of the Great Wall around Beijing municipality are especially famous, they were frequently renovated and are regularly visited by tourists today. The Bidaling Great Wall near Zhang Jiaqiu is the most famous stretch of the wall. For this is the first section to be open to the public in the People's Republic of China, as well as the showpiece stretch for foreign dignitaries. South of Bidaling is the Juyong Pass. When used by the Chinese to protect the land, this section of the wall had many guards to defend China's capital Beijing made of stone and bricks from the hills. This portion of the Great Wall is high and wide. One of the most striking sections of the Ming Great Wall is where it climbs extremely steep slopes in Jin Shanling. There it runs long ranges from in height and across the bottom, narrowing up to across the top. Wang Jinglu Wang Jinglu is one of Jin Shanling's 67 watchtowers above sea level. Southeast of Jin Shanling is the Mushanyu Great Wall which winds along lofty, cragged mountains. From the southeast to the northwest for, it is connected with Juyongguan Pass to the west, and Gubeikou to the east. This section was one of the first to be renovated following the turmoil of the Cultural Revolution. At the edge of the Bohai Gulf is Shanghai Pass, considered the traditional end of the Great Wall and the first pass under heaven. The part of the wall inside Shanghai Pass that meets the sea is named the Old Dragon Head. North of Shanghai Pass is Zhaoshan Great Wall, the site of the first mountain of the Great Wall. Northeast from Shanghai Guan is Jiamengkou Jiamengkou, which is the only portion of the wall that was built as a bridge. Beyond Jiamengkou, an offshoot known as the Liaodong Wall continues through Liaoning Province and terminates at the Hushan Great Wall, in the city of Dandong near the North Korean border. In 2009, 180 kilometers of previously unknown sections of the wall concealed by hills, trenches, 
and rivers were discovered with the help of infrared rangefinders and GPS devices. In March and April 2015 nine sections with a total length of more than believed to be part of the Great Wall were discovered along the border of Ningxia Autonomous Region and Gansu Province. Characteristics Before the use of bricks, the Great Wall was mainly built from rammed earth, stones, and wood. During the Ming, however, bricks were heavily used in many areas of the wall, as were materials such as tiles, lime, and stone. The size and weight of the bricks made them easier to work with than earth and stone. So construction quickened. Additionally, bricks could bear more weight and endure better than rammed earth. Stone can hold under its own weight better than brick, but is more difficult to use. Consequently, stones cut in rectangular shapes were used for the foundation, inner and outer brims, and gateways of the wall. Battlements line the uppermost portion of the vast majority of the wall, with defensive gaps a little over tall, and about wide, from the parapets. Guards could survey the surrounding land. Communication between the army units along the length of the Great Wall, including the ability to call reinforcements and warn garrisons of enemy movements, was of high importance. Signal towers were built upon hilltops or other high points along the wall for their visibility. Wooden gates could be used as a trap against those going through. Barracks, stables, and armories were built near the wall's inner surface. Condition while some portions north of Beijing and near tourist centers have been preserved and even extensively renovated, in many locations the wall is in disrepair. Those parts might serve as a village playground or a source of stones to rebuild houses and roads. Sections of the wall are also prone to graffiti and vandalism, while inscribed bricks were pilfered and sold on the market for up to 50 renminbi. Parts have been destroyed because the wall is in the way of construction. A 2012 report by the State Administration of Cultural Heritage states that 22% of the Ming Great Wall has disappeared, while of wall have vanished. More than of the wall in Gansu province may disappear in the next 20 years due to erosion from sandstorms. In places, the height of the wall has been reduced from more than to less than various square lookout towers that characterize the most famous images of the wall have disappeared. Many western sections of the wall are constructed from mud, rather than brick and stone, and thus are more susceptible to erosion. In 2014 a portion of the wall near the border of Liaoning and Hebei province was repaired with concrete. The work has been much criticized. From the Moon One of the earliest known references to the myth that the Great Wall can be seen from the Moon appears in a letter written in 1754 by the English antiquary William Stukeley. Stukeley wrote that, this mighty wall of fourscore miles, 130 kilometers, in length is only exceeded by the Chinese wall, which makes a considerable figure upon the terrestrial globe, and may be discerned at the moon. The claim was also mentioned by Henri Norman in 1895, where he states, besides its age it enjoys the reputation of being the only work of human hands on the globe visible. From the Moon, the issue of canals on Mars was prominent in the late 19th century, and may have led to the belief that long, thin objects were visible from space. The claim that the Great Wall is visible from the Moon also appears in 1932's Ripley's Believe It or Not, Strip and in Richard Halliburton's 1938 book Second Book of Marvels. The claim the Great Wall is visible from the Moon has been debunked many times, but is still ingrained in popular culture. The wall is a maximum wide 
and is about the same color as the soil surrounding it. Based on the optics of resolving power only an object of reasonable contrast to its surroundings which is a more in diameter would be visible to the unaided eye from the Moon, whose average distance from Earth is the apparent width of the Great Wall from the Moon is the same as that of a human hair viewed from away. To see the wall from the Moon would require spatial resolution 17,000 times better than normal vision. Unsurprisingly, no lunar astronaut has ever claimed to have seen the Great Wall from the Moon from low Earth orbit. A more controversial question is whether the wall is visible from low Earth orbit. NASA claims that it is barely visible, and only under nearly perfect conditions. It is no more conspicuous than many other man-made objects. Other authors have argued that due to limitations of the optics of the eye and the spacing of photoreceptors on the retina, it is impossible to see the wall with the naked eye, even from low orbit and would require visual acuity of 20 thirds. Astronaut William Pogue thought he had seen it from Skylab, but discovered he was actually looking at the Grand Canal of China near Beijing. He spotted the Great Wall with binoculars, but said that it wasn't visible to the unaided eye. U.S. Senator Jake Garn claimed to be able to see the Great Wall with the naked eye from a space shuttle orbit in the early 1980s, but his claim has been disputed by several U.S. astronauts. Veteran U.S. astronaut Gene Kernan has stated, at Earth orbit of high, the Great Wall of China is, indeed, visible to the naked eye. Ed Liu, Expedition 7 science officer aboard the International Space Station, adds that, it's less visible than a lot of other objects. And you have to know where to look. In 2001, Neil Armstrong stated about the view from Apollo 11, I do not believe that, at least with my eyes, there would be any man-made object that I could see. I have not yet found somebody who has told me they've seen the Wall of China from Earth or that. I've asked various people, particularly shuttle guys, that have been many orbits around China in the daytime, and the ones I've talked to didn't see it. In October 2003, Chinese astronaut Zhang Liwei stated that he had not been able to see the Great Wall of China. In response, the European Space Agency issued a press release reporting that from an orbit between, the Great Wall is visible to the naked eye. In an attempt to further clarify things, the ESA published a picture of a part of the Great Wall photograph from low orbit. However, in a press release a week later, they acknowledged that the Great Wall in the picture was actually a river. Leroy Chiao, a Chinese-American astronaut, took a photograph from the International Space Station that shows the wall. It was so indistinct that the photographer was not certain he had actually captured it. Based on the photograph, the China Daily later reported that the Great Wall can be seen from space with the naked eye under favorable viewing conditions if one knows exactly where to look. However, the resolution of a camera can be much higher than the human visual system and the optics much better, rendering photographic evidence irrelevant to the issue of whether it is visible to the naked eye. Thank you for watching. Brought to you by Wikivd Documentaries. Please like and subscribe below. Please like and subscribe below.